Oops, welcome. Uh, lip readers know what I just said. I want to go over some graphing uh, concepts and then talk about some of the items on the quiz that just occurred uh, recently. So quiz number three, go over some of those problems. Go over the problems themselves, but then also talk a little bit about where I think some students might be having issues uh, just in general with, with things. So this is uh, problem number 49. I'm sorry, 59. I can't even read. I'll underline it. That will make it all clear. So by taking the slope of the curve in this figure, verify that the velocity of the jet car is 115 meters per second at t equals 20 seconds. Well, there are a couple ways to do this. If you remember from middle school to find the slope uh, of a curved line, oops, let me get my pen here appropriately held. You determine the slope of the tangent at that point. Oops. Let's uh, actually let's modify the sentence a little bit here. Uh, so uh, instead of find the tangent line, find the slope of the tangent line. So if we use our handy dandy line maker here and find the slope and let's see if we can, oops. Don't want. So this one we're going to eliminate, and this one we're going to place right there. All right, so here is a line that is tangent, sort of, to that point. So the slope. And let's use a different color here. So it looks like we're going from there. And so that's at this time in zero. And if we go up here, thirty and that one. Yes, yeah, so sorry, that's not a very straight line. But so if we find the slope then is rise over run. So 2,500 meters minus zero meters divided by 30 minus what well, that looks like about seven. So 30 seconds minus seven seconds, so that's 2,500 divided by 23 meters per second. And since I didn't know how this would actually turn out, I didn't do it on the calculator beforehand. So to two significant figures, that's 110 meters per second. So that's one way to do it. Another way that we could do it, and I'm not going to go completely through this way, but you could say, all right, let's take the, the data points that we know that are closest to it. So for example, we could take these two data points and figure out 
because even though uh, I'll figure out the slope, because even though there's a curved line there, if we're taking a segment of a curved line, the smaller the segment that we pick, the straighter that curved line is going to be. So we could do that, or some other people might pick these two points, or somebody else might even pick. these two points right here. Uh, if you can draw a good tangent line, that's going to be the most precise. All right, and choice, or part B, uh, by taking the slope of the curve at any point at figure 2.21, verify that the jet car's uh, acceleration is 5 meters per second. So since it's a straight line, we can take any points here, so it looks like we've got acceleration equals delta V over delta T, so V, the V at the top, it looks like it's about, um, what, 170 or so? 170 minus, and then down here it's about 20. 170 minus 20 meters per second divided by 30 minus 0. So 30 seconds, 170 minus 20 is 150. 150 divided by 30 is 5 meters per second per second. So just a little review there, and if we go back to our equations, so we first used this one that can be written x minus x0 over t minus t0, and the book likes to use these simplifications, so instead of delta t, book uses T, so it assumes that it doesn't matter what time of day you do this, we can start our watch whenever, so we're going to say T0 is equal to 0, and delta X is X final, which apparently they're saving ink, they just use X minus X initial. If you've got problems, like I've done in the past, where you have some intermediate steps, you can use X0, X1, X2, or X0, X1, X final, say three positions are of relevance. You're not limited to just use two positions. There are more than two positions in this world. For part B of what we just did, we used this. And this has a little bar over it. So so this for constant acceleration. So acceleration equals delta V over delta T, or V minus V0 over T minus T0. So that's what we just used. Next problem is to find, uh, it shows the displacement graph, so it shows the position versus time graph, and we want to know the velocity and acceleration versus time graphs. So let's uh, take a look at that. I'm just finding my notes here. Uh, yeah, we'll use, we'll use black here. Be a little bit boring. So between 0 and 1, and let's see, I could have done this a little bit better here, so I'm good. 1, 2, 3. So I'm going to stop the recording and make the little, put the little hash marks in, because it's boring for you to watch me put the hash marks in. I should have done that beforehand.
So I'm back. I put the hash marks in. So between 0 and 1 second, uh, so we've got constant velocities throughout, and we've got these little points here that are actually sort of tricky. These show really discontinuities in velocities. So while it shows a sharp bend there, in real life, you'd have a really tiny curve there at each of these bends, and we'll cover that with the acceleration. So it looks like we're going from uh, 0 to 1 meter in 0 to 1 seconds. And then the next second, we're going from 1 to 2 seconds. And that's 2 meters. So 1 divided by 1, and then we have 1 divided by 1 here. So in the next second, we're going from 2 down to negative 3 in one second. So we're going from 2 down to negative 3. So that's a negative, so 2, so final minus additional negative 3 minus 2 is negative 5 over 1. So we're going to have, I didn't plan very well here. And that's for the next second. And then from 3 to 5, so here's 1, 2, 3, from 3 to 5, we're at zero velocity. And then from 5 to 6, it looks like it goes up one meter in one second. So we've got that. So for the accelerations, since all these velocity lines are flat, we are going to just have a flat line here. For the acceleration. Now you could be asking yourself, what about these little bends here? So what would probably be the best way to represent that, in order to be going from a positive velocity to a negative velocity very quickly, you'd need a rapid negative acceleration. So you'd probably have just some sort of, and that would be at two seconds. You'd probably have some sort of a drop down like that. And to go. Uh, so that's to go from that to there. To go from the negative acceleration, um, negative acceleration, or I'm sorry, negative velocity, to zero velocity, you're going to need some slowing down. So if you're going with the negative velocity, the thing that will slow you down is a positive force. So there's a positive acceleration. And then, so here, here, and here, then, so at five seconds, one, two, three, four, five, we're going to need another, so we're going from zero, oops, sorry, to positive this way. So, So this, this represents the large acceleration needed to change direction. or to start moving. Or to stop.
let's go over the problems then that you uh, just completed. So this one, uh, it's going to have slightly different numbers than what you have. But this person rode a rocket sled, and he was going 282 meters per second, which is uh, 1,000 kilometers per hour. And it's uh, also very fast in terms of miles per hour, roughly twice that. So that would be about 500 miles per hour. And he was brought to a rest in five seconds. Oh, he accelerated, I'm sorry, from zero to this in five seconds. And then he was stopped in just 1.4 seconds. So calculate his acceleration and his deceleration, which means his um, negative acceleration in this case. And express each in multiples of g. So accelerating from rest, so the first time, a1 is v final minus v initial. So 282 meters per second minus 0 divided by 5 minus 0 seconds. And let me find my work here. Just neatening things up. All right, so that equals. 56.4 um, meters per second per second. So if we just want to compare that to G, the ratio of A1 over G is 56.4 meters per second squared divided by 9.8 meters per second squared. And that comes out to be a ratio of 5.76. So 5.76 G. And note that this is a positive number. So these ratios should be positive. And that's where some people get confused because with the next one you can see the accelerations again end up being negative. But then you have to decide, well, what do we use for G? Do we use negative 9.8 or positive 9.8? And if we were to use negative here, 56 minus or divided by the negative 9.8 would have left us with a negative number. So just to forget about that, we use the absolute value in each case. So A2. So now brought jarringly back to rest in 1.4 seconds. So now they, this person went from 282 to 0. So since acceleration, I should have wrote this down. I should have written this down to begin with. We know that's V final minus V initial over T final minus T initial. So now the final is 0. The initial is 282 meters per second. And this time, it happens in 1.4 seconds. So that turns out to be it's a negative number, negative, wait for it, wait for it, 201 meters per second per second. So the ratio of A2 over G is 201 meters per second per second divided by 9.8 meters per second per second. The units cancel out. And we end up with 20.6 g. So I'm guessing with that amount of g-force, some of you have probably heard the term g-force before, this poor person blacked out. But the, the key to getting these problems right when it's looking for the ratio is you need to be positive and we can deal with that by using the absolute values. Here was another problem that some folks uh, had issues with. 
there's actually two parts. I'll skip the first part. The first part's really just a simple plugging in. And this one isn't too much more than that, but it allows us to at least draw a picture. So an airplane's flying at 200 meters per second. It slows down to land with an acceleration of 20 meters per second squared, or meters per second per second. So we've got our airplane flying. So it's flying at an initial velocity of 200 meters per second. It slows down to land. And what's the minimum length of runway needed? So I guess what I didn't say here is we assume the plane comes to rest. So it doesn't say what's the minimum runway length needed to crash into the trees at the end. So our final velocity then is zero. We can start our number line anywhere. So we'll say that is zero. And x final, we don't know that. We don't know how long it takes to land. But we can assume it doesn't really depend on the time of day. So we can set this equal to zero. So the velocity is in this direction, but the plane is slowing down. So that must mean that the acceleration is in this direction, which means that the acceleration then must be negative. So A equals negative 20 meters per second squared. And so this is a place probably where people got a little bit confused just because it gives you a number or it says a deceleration of something. Uh, you need to look at the logistics here. So if we look at our useful kinematics equations, we could use this first one here. We know the acceleration. We know v0, but we don't know time, and we don't know the position. So so if we use. Uh, actually, let's go with a different color here because there's going to be some brainstorming. I'm going to use a lighter color here. So if we use x equals 0 plus v0 t plus 1 half a t squared, that's OK. But the problem with that is we'll need to do this in two steps. So we don't know t or x. So it's better to find an equation That's some pretty poor penmanship there. So better to find an equation that doesn't include t. And in the discussion board, a few folks have mentioned that one of the issues they're having with the problems is deciding which equations to use or finding the appropriate equations. So this kind of thought process, if you 
draw a diagram, you make note of all the knowns and all the unknowns. And even if you anticipate that maybe, like right here, it doesn't say anything about the time, so you might be tempted to not write it down. In this case, I did make note that, okay, T0 is 0, T, we don't know what that is. It turns out that we can find an equation without even considering T, but sometimes we need to solve for one unknown and then solve for the second one. In this case, we don't need to do this in two steps because if we look down here, here we've got, okay, we don't know what V is, but we do know what V0 is. Oh, I'm sorry, we do know what V is. That's V final, which is zero. We know what V0 is. That was the 200 meters per second. We know what A is, and we don't know what X is. So this is the equation that we're going to use. x minus x zero. So we can get rid of some things right off the bat. So v is equal to zero. And x zero is equal to zero. So negative two a x equals v0 squared, so the square root of negative 2ax equals v0. And right now, I'm sweating it out a little bit because I see a negative sign under the square root, so let's hope that something good comes of that, like maybe we win the negative under the square root lottery. So negative, we don't like that. Two, that's not helping things at all. A, uh, look at that. Acceleration is negative 20.0 meters per second per second. And x, oh, that was dumb of me. I thought I was thinking, oh, we need to find v0. So uh, let's just cross that off. You're saying, there's five minutes of my life I'll never get back. I apologize. And I didn't need to cross that one off. So negative 2ax equals v0 squared. So x equals v0 squared over negative 2a. So v0 is... 200 meters per second. We square that. Divide by 2, negative 1 times 2, times negative 20 meters per second per second. And let's look at the dimensions of that. So m squared, so we've got seconds squared cancels with seconds and seconds. Here, one of the meters cancels with one of the meters down here, but then we end up with units of meters. This and this, uh, negative times negative is positive. So 200 divided by, so 200 squared is... 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, divided by 40, or 1,000, sorry to squish this in here, meters. And I missed a question earlier. I apologize for that. But this right here, so the question was, do the ratios also need to be whole numbers? So I mentioned that they need to be positive. 
And no, they don't need to be whole numbers. So these can be, so note that these are not, I mean, they could be whole numbers, but they need not be. So not whole numbers, and that's OK. And then finally, let's start with something happy, a rescue helicopter. A rescue helicopter is hovering over a person whose boat is sunk. Uh, one of the rescuers throws a life preserver down to the victim with an initial velocity of 2.4 meters per second and observes that it takes 1.8 seconds to reach the water. So let's draw this here. So we've got our helicopter. And they also have a little counter right there. So in this case, V0, and this is where I think a lot of people made a mistake. So straight down at 1.4 meters per second, so that means negative 1.4 meters per second. We don't know what the velocity is when it reaches the victim. So there's our life preserver. Uh, T initial doesn't matter the time of day, so we can set that at zero. We know that T final equals 1.8 seconds. So now we need to set up Y initial and Y final. So Y initial and can be whatever we want it to be. This is just a number line. So this is like taking our ruler. And here's our ruler. That's not a very good ruler. I recognize that. But we can move this ruler wherever we want to. If we want to start our ruler here, that's fine. If we want to start our ruler down here, that's fine as well. That doesn't mean that this point doesn't exist. It's just if this is 0 on the ruler at the top, then uh, actually, let's say it's 0 on the ruler at the bottom. I made my ruler crooked. Then that's going to be a positive value. If we have this somewhere in the middle of the ruler is our starting point, then this is, initial is going to be a different value. But wherever we have the ruler, delta y is going to be the same. So. So delta y is the same no matter where we have our zero point. So there are really two values that make sense here. We could say, OK, either, so the best choice, Either y0 equals 0 or y final equals 0. If y initial equals 0, then that means that y is going to be a negative number if we measure if up is positive. So if we use our traditional number line, which I probably should have drawn. Uh, before, but here's our traditional number line where x gets positive, uh, gets bigger to the right, and y gets bigger upwards. So that's what we're basing all of our positives and negatives on. If we say that y is equal to 0, then y initial will be greater than 0. So that fits in with this here. So I am, in order to do this, let's look at our formulas in order to figure out what the best choice is. So I don't know the final velocity. 
so an equation with final velocity wouldn't really make sense. I do know the time duration uh, or the time interval. I do know the initial velocity. So it looks like this is going to be the best equation to use here. And remember, this is just generic. So x is a generic parameter. Here it's up and down. So obviously we're going to be using y instead of x. So oh, uh, let's just quickly go back to that. So using this, it'll be a little bit easier if I say that y0 is equal to 0, because then I've got a target variable here all by itself. If I say that this one is equal to 0, then I might goof up a negative sign by having to move this over to the other side. So I think that the best thing to do is to say that y0 is equal to 0. We can actually do it both ways. So we're going to use, and that means that this is our target variable. All right, and when I was in college, I used to work at a target store, so I like the whole target variable idea. So we're going to use y equals y0 plus v0 t plus 1 half a t squared. And in this case, a is equal to negative g, which is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So I said that this was equal to 0. So y equals v0, which is negative 1.4 meters per second times 1.8 seconds plus 1 half negative 9.8 meters per second squared times 1.8 seconds squared. So notice we've got a negative here. We've got a negative here. And let me find my notes there just to make sure. So we get a negative 18 meters. So now we need to ask ourselves, did we answer the question? And the question, I don't think I've used the light blue that much today. So the question is, how high above the water was the preserver released from? So this, I get an answer of negative 18. So that means that this down here is negative 18 meters. That's not a very good looking M. But if this is negative 18, how far above negative 18 was the helicopter? So no, we didn't answer it quite yet. The actual answer is positive. was 18 meters above the water. So if you look at this, you might say to yourself, hmm, OK, would there have been a better strategy here? So I said that our target variable was y. And that's kind of the standard way to go about it. You might say, OK, we're, we're up here. We're dropping it from up here. We don't know how far down the water is, so we're going to make that the target variable. But in this case, a better choice, so a better approach, slightly better, would have been to say that y0 was our target variable.
call y0 the target variable then we can call y equal to zero. So the water level is zero. Well, actually, it's right here. The water level is zero. And we'll then get an answer that is, uh, we'd actually get a positive answer. Because this would have been zero. And we would have then moved this one over to the other side of the equal sign. These two would have been negative. This would have been a negative number. All of the negatives would have canceled each other out. So you need to be careful with the signs. So in terms of where people get confused, the signs here. And then don't just change things magically into positive numbers. So don't just say that, OK, if this is 0, then this is automatically going to be a positive number. Because you can't say that if I say this is 0, if I say y initial is 0, and I say acceleration is negative 9.8, that means that this number here, y final, has to be a negative number. Because I've said up is positive, I've said down is negative. So a lower position needs to be farther to the left on the number line, which means a negative number if this is 0. So hopefully that cleared things up with a couple different issues, the problems and then also going over the graphs here as well. So questions? Paul, you're the one who's uh, intensely listening in. Next week, oh, actually, today is, um, yeah, so the next time we're together, I'll start into two-dimensional motion, because it's pretty much covers all of the concepts that we're going to get to with one-dimensional motion. And two-dimensional two motion, you might say, oh, well, two-dimensional motion is going to be a lot more difficult. Really, with two-dimensional motion, we deal with these same equations here, uh, especially when we think about projectile motion. We deal with these same equations because what is valid in the x direction, the horizontal direction, is also valid in the up and down direction as well. Yeah, so Paul mentioned the slope one with the the jet here. So really understanding graphs helps you understand the formulas. Because you can, sure, you can memorize formulas, and people have varying skills in terms of memorizing. But saying, uh, let's see, yeah, let's use the red here. So, OK, so there's a formula that you can memorize. But this really is just, this is just a mathematical version of the slope of the velocity versus time graph. And I can just quickly sketch that. This is not going to be a very good looking sketch. So multiple representations are important. Understanding the formula, that's good. Understanding the graph, that's good. So if you can understand the graph, say, 80%, you can understand the formula, 80%, that means you've probably understood the concept. 90%. And if you can interpret a word problem, so a verbal description, if you can, if you have mastery of that at maybe the 80% level, combining all those almost good, perfect, but good, but not perfect skills together, you get a much closer to perfect understanding. So with this one here, I've colored in these points. Let me just draw this because Paul asked, 
would it have been a better choice to use the points? So let's uh, do this kind of kind of neat, but not super neat. And I won't have all of these points, so I'll do one, two, three, four, five. So let's say you want to find the velocity at the point I'm about to circle. You want to find the velocity here. And then Paul asked, well, can we just use the first and the last points? Depending on where the first and the last points are located, yeah, you, you could. If they're symmetric around the point that you want, then that would work out. But that wouldn't always work out. If you're going to use points, so if you're going to use points, from the graph, use points that are close together. And in fact, as close to the point in question as possible. So in this example, a better choice if you're going to use points would have been to use this point and this point. If you can find a tangent line nicely, that is a, a, a good choice as well. But it's sometimes hard to just sketch a tangent line. You're sort of eyeballing it. Uh, any other questions? So the key the key to understanding is multiple representations. So you might say to yourself, well, why should I really study the graphs when he's going to ask us the equations on the test? Well, it is true. On the mid-quarter and the final, we'll have equation problems. But there will also be some graphing questions as well. And even if there weren't graphing questions, as I said, understanding the graphs help you understand the formulas. So you really get a good sense of what uh, this equation here means if you realize that just represents the slope of the velocity versus time graph. OK, thanks for watching. Hopefully that was helpful. And I will virtually see you the next time we do one of these. Thanks.